Good afternoon. Um, welcome to the new CAP and PACT. Um, this event is organized by the European Environmental Bureau, BirdLife, and our German member organization, NABU. Um, as the EB's Deputy Secretary General, I'm very pleased to welcome you this afternoon. The objective of the event, sorry, the objective of the event is Okay, <laughs> I'll try again. So the objective of the event today is to have a, a deeper look into the new CAP. Um, we want to explore how well it does uh, in addressing the climate, biodiversity, and pollution crisis and ensuring long-term food security. Well, it's not, um, I'm not sure if this is working, it keeps cutting. Well, okay, I'll continue. So it's not uh, a secret that things are not too rosy. Um, the triple planetary crises are accelerating in Europe and globally, and agriculture sees the negative effects of those crises, droughts, heat waves, degraded soil, and so on. At the same time, in the intensive farming model is also driving the planetary crisis. The farming population is aging and shrinking, we have lost millions of farms across Europe, um, and it's very often not a sustainable livelihood anymore to run a family farm. The world has enough food, yet we spoil 57 million tons of food alone in Europe every year, worth 130 billion euros. So millions of people go hungry in the world, and in industrialized countries, we suffer from obesity and other health, um, food diet-related uh, health impacts unexpected crises a pandemic and russia's invasion in okay one more time <laughs> so um there are the unexpected crises, um, a pandemic, the invasion of uh, Russia and Ukraine, and these crises are exposing um, the dangers that lie in long supply chains we rely upon for everything from fertilizers to feedstock, um, relying on volatile markets and price speculation. So the agricultural sector has been going from one economic crisis to the other, there's an underlying social health and environmental crisis on top of that. So isn't it time to break this cycle? The CAP um, has been driving unsustainable agriculture in the EU. Um, there's been many, many evaluation studies and research that have shown that the previous reform of the CAP has failed to address pollution, to address biodiversity loss, um, and those have continued roughly at the same level than before the previous um, reform, while at the same time more and more farmers give up their jobs. So today we're here to launch um, a new report, um, which is presented by EB, BirdLife and NABU. Um, we have prepared it in collaboration with experts um, in our member organizations in 16 um, EU countries. Um, the report assesses 17 CAP strategic plans for their ambition, both in terms of quantity and quality, on climate action, biodiversity, um, biodiversity conservation, restoration, and the protection of the key natural resources that underpin our abil ability to produce food. What we'd like to do with the report is to contribute to evidence-based discussions on where we stand with the CAP and its green credentials so that we can take action to remedy its shortcomings. We'd also like to contribute to being um, more transparent and honest to people whose taxes fund this policy and whether these taxes are spent wisely and for the common good. So I hope you enjoy this discussion this afternoon and I'm handing back over to the moderator and um, wish you fruitful discussions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Patricia. 
Uh, welcome, good afternoon everybody, thank you for being here. Uh, I'm delighted to be your moderator today. My name is Christina Wunder and uh, let me tell you we have an exciting event ahead of us today. Um, the title is The New Cap Unpacked and indeed there is a lot to unpack today. We will hear insights as you've heard, um, a new report will be presented as well as uh, real life case studies from four different member states um, and we'll also have the chance to follow an interesting um, discussion between experts and practitioners and we will close off at six. Uh, with um, networking drinks, so make sure to stay through to the end. Um, and of course, I want to extend a very warm welcome as well to everybody who is following this virtually. And joining us online now, let's all welcome Sabrina Gaba, who is a senior researcher at INRE, Institut National de la Recherche Agronomique, um, and she will set the scene for us. Um, hi everyone, uh, thank you for the invitation. So as it had been said, I'm a research, uh, uh, senior research at INRAE in France. And so I've been asked to present some work on the role of biodiversity uh, in agriculture. So I hope that you can see my screen. And if so, I will start now. Um, so um, the, as you know, um, you are very familiar by, with this curve, which presents the effects uh, of, the, of climate change on temperature. And um, this is one of our big issue, but another one that is all sometimes called the second is issue is the decrease of biodiversity. But for us, this is one, a main issue, and you will see why in agriculture. By, by, by all over, these two uh, issues are of the tip of an iceberg because there are all other issues that human uh, well being are facing now, such as poverty, uh, anger, uh, the, all the war, and also inequalities. And all these problems are known as wicked problems in sustainability science, which means that we cannot deal with one problem without affecting all the others. And these are complex, interrelated, independent, dynamic and complex. And agriculture is one of these wicked problems, but not all agriculture, but this, uh, the intensive model of agriculture, the productivist one. And the, this model is at the crossroads of many challenges of the Anthropocene. First, first of all, it's uh, highly dependent on fossil fuel. Uh, for example, 600 liters of oil are needed to produce one hectare of wheat. It's also, it has also high impact on climate change, also on land use, of course, on the biodiversity, because uh, almost 86% of species are now threatened by agriculture. And these models also threaten the health of human and also is also related to uh, several particle disorder. So which uh, agriculture do you need now? Uh, in other words, which agriculture is needed or can uh, make our food system resilient? Uh, if I draw a simple picture, uh, nowadays there is two uh, passwords that can be uh, that are uh, that are been explored. The first one is one that is relying on technology, many using robots for fertilization, even drones for pollinations, and the other passwords is more relying on keeping flowers in landscapes farmers in fields and using and, and letting uh, plants being pollinating by insects. And this is the second password that we are exploring in my groups. And this is how we see uh, agroecology. So this paradigm shift on which uh, agriculture uh, can be uh, explored now and a new model of agriculture can be explored. So I will present uh, shortly uh, the study site on which I'm working, uh, which is 
a small area uh, in the south of Deux-Sèvres, which is one of the departments of uh, Nouvelle-Aquitaine region, the west of France. And this area uh, is also a research infrastructure that has been creating in 1994, and um, on which we work with farmers uh, since uh, 30 years now, for 30 years now. Uh, it has, uh, although it's very small, it has very diversified agriculture models, such as organic farming and also conventional farming. And it also has very different landscape type. So here we work directly with farmers in this field and we explore different uh, solutions that are based on nature. So we have conducted for 10 years experiments on crop pollination, and we have looked on how pollination can impact uh, the yield, and especially the yield of two mass flowering crops, which are all seed rape and sunflower. So the graphs which is presented here shows how um, biodiversity affects the yield of oil seed rape, and what we've what we have uh, estimated is that pollination by insect can increase the yields of oil seed rape up to thirty percent. We have also found the same results on sunflowers. So the yield of sunflowers that have been pollinated with uh, pollinators, insect pollinators, mainly honeybees, show higher yield up to uh, forty percent. And this increase of production directly translates into increase of incomes for farmers that has been estimated in oil seed rape on average of 110 euros per hectare. So this is very interesting to explore. Then we, we, we went further and we wanted to compare uh, how pollination by insects uh, and agrochemicals behave on crop production. So we compare these two strategies, and this is what is shown here on this graph. So what we can see is that we can obtain high yields, uh, both with uh, honeybees and insects in general, and with agrochemicals. So here agrochemicals are both pesticides and fertilization. But if we look now on the results on gross margin, we, have, we can see that's only a nature-based solution. So insect pollination can increase the gross margin of farmers. And the, the, how to explain this is because the, the, the cost of insect pollination is much lower than the cost of agrochemicals. So pollination is therefore a nature-based solution that's allowed allow to conceal both production and the economy of farmers. But the main question is how to maintain this insect in agricultural landscapes. And here there is not many ways, there is two ways. They need to have food, so for our resources, and they also need to have nesting sites. And so for flora resources, what, what we resources, sorry, for what we have seen is that the higher the richness in flowers, the higher the bee richness. And among these floral the flower plants that are used by, by bees, we can see that weeds, so uh, the all the white plants are widely used by bees and especially by honeybees that forage on weeds between the, the flowering of oil seed rape and sunflowers. So this is a result which has been obtained by analyzing all the pollen that's uh, been foraged by the bees and one of the plants that has been highly foraged by honeybees was uh, the poppy. So what we have done with farmers on, my, on the study side is to explore how we can maintain weeds in crops, because weeds are seen by farmers as pests, as they use the same resources on the crop, and so they compete for the crops and can lead to crop loss. So we developed what we call socio-ecological experiment with farmers, 
which consists in um, selecting uh, fields along a gradient of management intensity. And in each field, we manipulate the use of farming practices. And in that case, we manipulated the uh, use of the intensity of wheat control and the use of nitrogen fertilization. And by we, I meant the farmers. So the farmers are the one who experiments and the one who decide how to reduce with control and how to reduce nitrogen fertilization. So here you have a picture of a farmer field uh, in which the farmer has reduced uh, the uh, inputs uh, for herbicide, for example, or mechanical weeding, and also inputs in nitrogen. We also have uh, an area in which the farmers has not seen uh, sown any crops, and you will see why after we had this uh, experimental treatment here. So here are the results of the experiment, and uh, what do these uh, results say? So first, uh, on the top, we have results on yield, on the bottom, on the gross margin. And what we observe, so both in organic farming in green and conventional in uh, blue, is that uh, the yield does not increase significantly with uh, an increase of nitrogen, nor with the increase of weed control intensity. And this is the same result in organic and conventional uh, farms. This result is also obtained on the protein content, which is a grain quality in cereals. And uh, as the yield is not directly uh, increased by a higher use of nitrogen or a higher weight control intensity, this translate directly by a decrease uh, in the economic performance. So here, the gross margin which is lower in farms where the intensity of use of nitrogen and weed control is higher. So why do we observe these results? Um, uh, so the main uh, reason is because in these fields, what we observe is that's only the presence of the crop, which uh, is was, comp was calculated by uh, comparing plots with no crops and with crop. So only the presence of the crop can reduce uh, a high level of weed biomass. So if I say the things in other words, the crops um, is, the, is better in regulating uh, weeds than the herbicides or mechanical uh, weeding in these weed uh, crops fields. So this is an evidence for an efficient role of crop computation in regulating weights. So um, then we also looked on how maintaining uh, floral resources and nesting sites by managing landscape. And uh, so we, we looked on, on how uh, bee abundance was modified by the landscape context and in oil seed rape fields. And what we observe is that bee abundance uh, significantly increase when the oil seed rape fields was in the landscapes in which a high amount of sunflowers was grown the year before. And this bee abundance also increase when the field uh, in which we observe these bees was surrounding was by a high amount of meadows and organic farming the same year. So, we Sabrina, wanted to go further to Sabrina, see if this, if, I'm almost finished, okay. but I can finish if you want now. Okay. Uh, so just to conclude, um, the biodiversity has beneficial role on agricultural production by increasing yields and regulating pests. Uh, this affects uh, also is equal to some of the agrochemicals and uh, and this uh, bi biodiversity has lower cost than uh, agrochemicals. Sorry for being long hair. Just sorry. All right. Thank you very very much, Sabrina. That was really interesting. Uh -oh.
Thank you, Sabrina, for your remarks. Um, I will now hand over to Evelyn van uh, Romburg, to, uh, who is the head of the EU office at Oxfam International, and will add some additional insights for us. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me. Hi, everyone, uh, here and online. It's really great to be here, and congratulations to EEB, NABU, and BirdLife for this event and also for uh, producing the paper that we're talking about today. So I'm going to zoom out a little bit, and I'm going to start with a chilling number, which is that one person is likely to die every 36 seconds between now and the end of the year. Um, in East Africa. So that's 150 people by the end of this event. And famine is likely to be declared in Somalia also before the end of the year. And there's been no famine in the world for the past decade. So that would be a huge setback on top of a huge human tragedy. We are not talking about a new food crisis. It's a new layer on top of already existing crises. The latest in a series of, of failures uh, to address a global broken food system. And a broken system which has been made even worse um, and fragile to, due to climate change, economic upheaval, uh, conflict, the pandemic, and human rights abuses. And uh, Sabrina also just referred to these crises in her presentation. People are not starving, they are being starved. And it's unacceptable that hundreds of millions of people are still going hungry in a world of plenty. And also not everyone is losing out in the current situation. The broken system, the broken, broken food system, is concentrating power and profits in the hand of only a few. So despite pushing millions of people into hunger, uh, the crisis has also created will, uh, winners as billionaires um, in the food and agribusiness uh, have seen their collective wealth increase by $382 billion in the last two years. Some may say that increasing food production in the EU could end hunger, no matter the long-term environmental impact of that. But that is not the solution. The EU should not be seen as having the role to feed the world, and also farmers globally already produce more than enough uh, food to feed the whole planet. But half of the eatable crops that are being produced go to either non-food use, such as biofuels, um, to feed animals or just being wasted or lost. And this is also already mentioned by Patricia earlier. So what we are witnessing today is not so much a food crisis, but an inequality crisis. And ach achieving sustainable food uh, security and zero hunger is primarily a matter of ensuring that everyone has access to affordable food, which means that they have an adequate income so that they can buy food and ensure food is sold at reasonable prices and not being wasted at, for example, uh, unsustainable biofuels. Another solution to help solve world hunger is to support low-income countries uh, to make them less dependent on import. For too long, many governments, including the EU, have focused all of their attention of pushing low-income countries towards the global value change and international trade. And as a result, many low-income countries are completely dependent uh, and, and have specialized their agricultural production for export at the cost of, uh, of their uh, local food production for local consumption. And this has forced them to procure also more food from the international market, exposing them to higher uh, importing bills, but also making them very dependent uh, and vulnerable to shocks, as we are seeing now as a result of the Ukraine crisis. So the EU should work towards rebalancing power in the global food system uh, to provide more support to sustainable domestic and local food production and in low-income countries. And this would then reduce their dependency on international markets and make them more resilient to shocks. It also means that international trade rules, which have for long been negotiated uh, to benefit farmers in rich countries, must be reshaped with greater space and power for low-income countries with food deficits to adjust their levels of food imports and exports and uh, invest in domestic food production. So the EU should respect its commitment to policy coherence and development in all its policies, including in agriculture. And it also means that the CAP, which is the topic of today, does not undermine the development of agri-food sector in low-income countries. 
because supporting European agriculture and European farmers should not be at the expense of farmers in low-income countries. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Evelyn. I'm now looking forward to introduce you to Marilda Dascali, um, Agriculture Policy Officer at BirdLife, and Celia Nissens, Senior Policy Officer for Agriculture and Food Systems at the European Environmental Bureau. Marilda and Celia will present to us the brand new report. Thank you. Thanks. Um, okay. <laughs> Challenging. <laughs> Um, I wish I had three arms. So hello everybody, um, thank you for being here. And I'm very pleased to present to you our new report and some key findings from this report. Okay, <laughs> it's fine, thanks. So, as uh, we saw uh, through Sabrina's uh, presentation, biodiversity and climate crisis uh, have intensified and the impacts uh, are increasing in frequency and magnitude. Um, moreover, we are attesting a loss in crucial biodiversity species and populations like pollinators uh, and insects in general. So, the previous cap has failed on many fronts to address these two crises, as we can see in the farmland bird index, uh, or even on the uh, population index for uh, butterflies. But just not, not only, because the cap is also driving the concentration of farms into the hands of a few, and uh, it's also driving the specialization and the intensification of agricultural practices. So, will the new cap, cap um, have better results? This is the question that we tried to uh, address by analyzing 17 cap strategic plans. So we did this in cooperation with uh, our agriculture experts from uh, our networks, from BirdLife and EEB uh, networks. And on the budget, uh, we considered uh, how these CAP strategic plans um, are al allocating the budget, and we just um, assessed the figures representing the European Union. On biodiversity, um, we looked at uh, how the CSPs are contributing to the biodiversity crisis. Um, so we focused on uh, the way the CAP surgic plan plants are contributing to uh, create space for nature on farms. And also we looked at the scale and the quality of intervention under the strategic objective six of the regulation. On climate, uh, we looked at peatlands and, uh, and wetlands as uh, these two interventions are critical uh, carbon sinks. And we also look uh, at the livestock sector and how the CSPs are bringing this sector into a safe operating space uh, by tackling the pollution and the GHG, uh, the greenhouse gases emission from the sector. On the natural resources, um, we looked at uh, how the CAP strategic plants are contributing to protecting natural resources, such as soil, water, and pollinators. Plus, we had a specific att attention on uh, the grasslands, because these uh, grasslands are important for the biodiversity and climate. So, where are the budget flows? <laughs> Um, member states have a lot of flexibility to allocate uh, the money and um, the first graphic, so the, the graphic that displays here the overall, overall budget for uh, the both pillars, pillars one, pillar two, and uh, the first figures that emerge is that on average 49% 14, um, of the budget uh, it's going to decoupled income support and 30% uh, it's for um, green measures, whether it's voluntary or, um, or, uh, or, or, or conditionality. So if we look in a more detail 
uh, way the budget allocation under the second pillar, um, we can see that the agro-environmental and climate measures represent the highest share, um, but um, up to 50% of the uh, areas of natural con constraint can also be considered as environmental spending, whereas we know uh, that this doesn't contribute uh, and doesn't give benefits for biodiversity or climate. Regarding the couple support, um, all the member states, except the Netherlands, um, offer a couple support. And in this couple support, overall 70% of um, this budget goes to livestock, which is roughly 12 billion euros. Regarding biodiversity, um, so we have looked uh, at the capture changing plans and how they address the biodiversity loss uh, through voluntary schemes, but uh, also through conditionality with the uh, GAGs 8 and 9. So seven uh, biodiversity related uh, indicators are present in the capsulogenic plans and here I presented to you the uh, results indicate 34. Um, where we can see that um, the areas um, are very low and this general um, perception, it's, it's seen throughout the different uh, results indicators. We see that the area for biodiversity purposes are very low and the cap strategic plans will hence not contribute to create enough space for nature on farms and achieve the 10% target, as, it's set, as it is set out in the um, biodiversity strategy. Moreover, the interventions, um, there are some of them that are positive, but still too much have no or minor effect on biodiversity. And what we can see uh, in this graph with the budget is that the bulk of the budget goes into inefficient interventions. Um, the interventions that, are, that have no minor effects or because the, the target is inadequate, they will receive the bigger envelopes at the end, which will not uh, be competitive for farmers and probably not be used by them at the end. Um, so I'm going to present the findings from the analysis of climate action, uh, starting with peatlands and wetlands, where we looked at the way that the new GAIC 2 is implemented uh, on the protection of peatlands. No, sorry, wrong button. And the, the short story is uh, it will not end the drainage of peatlands, which is currently responsible for about 5% of the EU's total greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and what we are seeing is that most countries are either delaying action on implementing this GAEC or are implementing it in a very weak way which will stop additional damage. Generally new drainage is forbidden but existing drainage will not have to be removed which is very disappointing. Um, a big issue is that uh, rewetted peatlands uh, used for agriculture will in many countries remain ineligible for direct payments, uh, even though there was a possibility given in, uh, in the cap regulation for member states to allow uh, farmers to keep direct payments if they rewet a peatland uh, as part of a voluntary measure. But not all countries are using this possibility. And there are uh, good voluntary measures for uh, using peatlands in a more sustainable way, for recreation of wetlands, uh, for raising the water table, things like that. But there are very few, um, and generally it seems very doubtful that these measures will really have an impact at large scale. On livestock, um, we looked at the voluntary measures that are being proposed uh, as eco-schemes and agri-environment climate measures. And generally, our, our national experts found that there were lots of interesting measures, but the big issue was that they tended 
to support systems that are already more sustainable, so for example, extensive systems, or very small improvements in systems that are not sustainable and that are very intensive. The majority of eco schemes and agri environment climate measures addressed at the livestock sector were targeting animal welfare improvements, support for grazing, or uh, support for rare or indigenous breeds, and there, were, there was very little for actual environmental sustainability. Um, and actually, no scheme was aimed at supporting farmers to extensify their production in areas that need this, places that have a nitrogen crisis, for example. Um, and a big concern when it comes to livestock is that although there are positive measures, we see that these will be dwarfed by the huge amounts that are likely to go to intensive uh, livestock production through coupled support and investment support for infrastructure. On natural resources, uh, I'm going to go through this very quickly. Um, but we looked at soil, uh, and in particular at the way that the three GAECs relevant for soil will be implemented. So this is on crop rotation, cover, soil cover in winter, and uh, tillage management. And generally we found that with a few exceptions, the ambition in the way that those GAECs are implemented is very low. So we can expect continued degradation of, of soils. And uh, the voluntary measures that we looked at um, were very often quite uh, narrowly focused, lacked a bit of a more holistic approach to soil management, and as a consequence, half of those that were assessed uh, were deemed by national experts to be likely to have very limited impacts, if any. On water, uh, again, there were some good measures. Uh, I think that's kind of the red line that you will get. There are some good measures, but uh, we also see that there will still be support for investments in the moderni modernization of irrigation, for example, with insufficient safeguards, which means that we are still expecting to see a lot of public money going to uh, unsustainable irrigation projects. And on pollinators, again, um, there were a few promising schemes, um, though, though too few. Um, and generally, as uh, Marilda commented, for biodiversity, we see a risk that the more ambitious measures will be underfunded um, with too low payment levels or too low target areas. Um, and so either will not be picked up, or if they are picked up, it will only happen on too small an area. Um, we didn't look in this report at fertilizers and pesticides, but wanted to highlight these in this context because especially as has been mentioned before in the light of the, the recent crises, it is clear that the, our reliance on these inputs is a vulnerability in our, in our agri-food system. So I just wanted to highlight these findings from a previous report that we did with WWF last year, which looked at draft eco-schemes, and so what we found there was that of the 21 uh, cow strategic plans, only 13 even had uh, an ambitious scheme for reducing uh, fertilizer use and only six for reducing pesticides use. Um, and of all the eco schemes that were relevant on these two dimensions, too many were likely to have very little impact or just to essentially be, be paying for small techno fixes or, or measures that will, were not gonna really tip the dial. So that led us to conclude um, that CAP plans uh, are very unlikely to deliver on the farm to fork strategy targets. Um, this is it for the detailed findings. So the very broad scope, the broad brush conclusions for this report, but you can see more uh, details in the executive summaries that are available at the back, is that essentially we're seeing that it's a step forward, but it's too little going too slow. Half of the CAP budget will continue to go to business as usual, um, with conditionality being too weak to really make a difference in, where the, in all the, the direct payments that will go to farmers to make those really greener. There will continue to be harmful subsidies, um, and here we highlight in particular the subsidies going to intensive livestock production and unsustainable irrigation. And, um, even though there is green spending, of course, uh, it is essentially the same amount uh, or the same share as in the current cap, and it might be slightly more targeted, but still, both qualitatively and quantitatively, um, we highly doubt that it will tip the needle for the huge environmental crises that have been already commented on by previous speakers. 
So we made some, some conclusions, some, sorry, some recommendations uh, for the Commission and for Member States. I'll just give you the keywords because we're running out of time here. So for Member States, we're asking, please, scale up the good measures. Innovate when you haven't set up a measure yet, for example, on extensification of livestock. Invest in advisory services and monitor the impact of measures. For the Commission, please uh, keep working to align cap strategic plans with the Green Deal and with existing environmental legislation. Guide member states in their implementation, for example, uh, implementation of uh, statutory management requirements, which uh, we know is, is an issue. Uh, enforce EU environmental law uh, and please monitor the impact of the policy um, and take action to remedy where the impacts are not uh, being seen. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariel Dan Celia. This was very insightful. We now have some minutes for questions from the audience. So if there are any questions, um, please let us know. If you can't think of questions right now, of course, we will have a coffee break as well as the networking drinks where you can address your burning questions uh, to the presenters. So thank you again. So in this next segment, I'm really looking forward to turning our focus into, uh, onto what this means in practice. So our experts today will take you, metaphorically speaking of course, to Poland, to Belgium, to the Netherlands and to Germany, um, as they will present their national case studies. First, we will hear from Aleksandra Peukowska Kroll, who is the Agriculture Coordinator at the Polish Society for the Protection of Birds. Good afternoon. I am representing Polish Society for the Protection of Birds, which is one of the biggest uh, environmental NGO in Poland. And our main aim is to protect birds, wild birds, and their habitats. We are implementing active, uh, active nature conservation, but we are also advocating for a systemic change for better <coughs> nature conservation. And to be more effective in uh, advocating for better agriculture uh, policy, a few years ago, uh, with other five uh, environmental NGO NGOs from Poland, we formed Agriculture for Nature, Nature Coalition. And why uh, it is uh, so important, uh, why agriculture policy is so important in our country? So uh, we have a strong evidence that uh, farmland biodiversity in Poland is in big uh, trouble nowadays. And here I am showing you uh, index of farmland uh, birds populations, which uh, I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> which uh, mm, dropped down by 20 percent between 2000 and 2020, uh, <clears throat> and in the same period situation of uh, meadows breeding waiters w were even worse and this uh, decline was 60 percent and nowadays this group of birds which are strongly linked to uh, agricultural landscape is uh, is the most endangered group of birds uh, in Poland that is why it is so uh, important and the reason for this is uh, unfavor <coughs> unfavorable conservation status of meadows, semi-natural wet meadows, uh, where these birds live, and uh, <coughs> and it is because land abandonment or uh, intensification uh, of use. And that is why uh, it is very important that in our new CAP uh, strategic plan, we will have continuation of uh, existing agri-environmental clim climatic schemes, uh, which aim to, uh, <coughs> which aim is to uh, support uh, extensive use of this kind of habitat. And we will also have a new eco scheme aim aiming at uh, extensive use, use of grasslands. And all these are very good. And let me 
replace picture into uh, some numbers. And you can see that it is planned that uh, 36 of permanent grasslands in Poland will be covered by this kind of support. And it is uh, quite a lot, but in the same time, uh, the amount of uh, subsidies will remain very low and, it is, and there is very big uh, <coughs> risk that farmers, especially small farmers, won't be interested in implementing schemes like they are, they are now. And in the same time, I wanted to show you a budget planet for couple support for bees, beef and diary. And it is more than triple uh, more than triple that of schemes I mentioned before. And this money will go directly to farmers, most often intensive industrial farmers, which don't have to meet any environmental requirements to get this money. And the next uh, very important things when we are talking about uh, farmland biodiversity decline uh, is non-productive -pro uh, areas and uh, <coughs> landscape features. And uh, it is planned that uh, Polish farmers will uh, be able to cover, uh, to, to restore or maintain such kind of areas on 3,26% of agriculture, uh, agricultural land. <clears throat> and it is an ideal situation, uh, which will be very difficult to meet, amongst others, because GAEC aid uh, there will be derogation for GAEC 8 in 2023. And even this 3,26%, it is still far from 10%, which is recommended by scientists and targeted by uh, biodiversity strategy. And last, but for sure not least, wetland uh, and peatlands protection and restoration, which is uh, of, prior, uh, of high priority when we talk about climate change mitigation, uh, reduction of uh, pollution run runoff from agricultural area to waters, water retention, as well as biodiversity protection. And here, just bad news from Poland. Uh, we, uh, uh, in our strategic plan, it is planned that uh, GAEC 2 will be delayed until 2025. So it means that uh, we, there will be no change in wetlands, peatlands conserv conservation for next uh, two years. And there is also lack of measures to, uh, to support <coughs> degraded peatlands restoration, as well as uh, development of paludiculture, which is uh, sustainable use of peatlands in their natural hydration level. So this is uh, all about uh, our CAP strategic plan, but in the end, I wanted to show you our motto, our org organization motto, which is by, pro by protecting birds, we protect much more. And in this particular uh, situation, when we are talking about <coughs> farmland biodiversity, by protect protecting farmland birds, we are protecting the whole scope of species but also other resources like water and soil, which are crucial for agriculture itself, for farmers' stability, but also for all of us, food security. That is why it is so important and we are fighting for better solutions in agriculture policy. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alexandra. I'm looking forward to handing over to Emmanuel Beguin, Agriculture Policy Officer at Natagora, to present the case study from Belgium. Thank you. So I will represent here Natagora, who is bird life partner in, uh, just here outside Brussels in the Walloon region. And also on behalf of IMPACT, which is a coalition of uh, five environmental uh, NGOs who have been officially involved in the, the stakeholder process of the new CAP strategic plan over the last three years in the Walloon region. Um, so when we think of Wallonia, we, we may be tempted to think about this, beautiful landscapes. Uh, this is high nature value, value farming, very extensive livestock. We also have this, which is like organic, organic systems emerging, growing emer uh, organic production of livestock. But the majority of the livestock production system is the conventional uh, farming system, heavily relying on inputs, on feed, directly feeding, you can see uh, animals in degraded uh, grasslands. Um, and we tend to see more and more very large um, livestock farms um, with hundreds of uh, animals, uh, so their number is continuously growing. And 
including a few uh, industrial uh, farming systems which do not anymore rely on grass at all. So behind the beautiful landscape pictures, it's, it's important to know that Walloon region is of the, one of the highest uh, in uh, livestock density in the EU, just after Netherlands and Flanders. Uh, and we have a growing, growing uh, very large and industrial farms. Um, so the, the, the really what's at stake here, uh, so I, I'm, I forgot to say that I'm uh, focusing narrowly on livestock support in my presentation because um, the Walloon CSP is the CSP with the highest share of budget dedicated to livestock, livestock support. So that's why I will focus only on livestock support in my, in my presentation. So it's like, it's 20% of the first pillar. So it's the only single uh, cap plan in the EU that has such a high share of support to livestock. Uh, so yeah, almost half of, of the agriculture area is composed of, of grasslands which is very important for carbon, water retention, uh, but protecting grassland is not enough. Uh, we have very high livestock density, and if we want to address the biodiversity crisis, the climate crisis, um, changing diets, increasing farm resilience, we need to really work on reducing livestock density very sharply, um, along with other measures that will help like, farmers to get sustainable livelihoods from actually markets and from, from their activity. Um, so what, what do we have in Wallonia? So we have coupled income support, uh, which is basically a productivist tool that, to help increase number of, of, of animals. The more animals you have, the more subsidies you get. Um, and on the other side, we say that we want to green the policy, so we add a new eco scheme that supports grasslands. A part of it uh, will encourage reducing livestock density uh, on the opposite side of the first tool, the coupled income support. Um, and then we have the NAECM, an agri-environment scheme that was already existing. This one was the one working on more sustainable levels of livestock density, and this one has been halved, like the, pay the unit payments from the previous cap to this new one have been divided by two. Um, so what's the reason, what, do what does it give? It gives this, so what we have added all of this, uh, when we make the sum of this support, we take the case of an average farm, 60 hectares here in Wallonia, one farmer, you, you add it up and you see um, for different livestock densities, so one, one unit, one animal per hectare, two, three, four, five, goes up to five, so just for you to know the average in the EU is one livestock unit per hectare, in Wallonia, the average is two livestock unit per hectare. So what do you see is that the new cap, um, so on the vertical axis, you have the amount of subsidies you will get from your livestock uh, production. Um, so, so you see on the left hand, if you, have, you are below two uh, livestock units per hectare, you will get around 15,000 euros on your farm. But if you go up and you intensify, you will go up to 20, 25, 30,000 euros. So you have a clear incentive to intensify your, your production in this new cap strategic plan. So you, need, you really need to go into more detail of what the measures add up to understand what's the impact of the future, the future cap um, beyond speeches and beyond objectives and beautiful narratives. Um, and in, in, uh, so that's the green, the new cap is the green curve and then you have the orange one which is the existing cap that we are finishing right now. And you can see that in the existing cap, you had like a double trend. You had for like most sustainable livestock systems below two LSU, you had an incentive to reduce livestock density that was existing from the, the good AECM for reducing livestock. So you can see if you reduce livestock density, you get more subsidies. And you had this really worrying, like very on the opposite, if you, you are more intensive, you will get lots of, lots of money. So you had this, so you, you also have uh, actually, the new cap also a, a good incentives that was supporting um, extensification of livestock. Um, so yeah, so in conclusion, um, governance is, is really at the center of the situation. Um, there were alternative policy options on the, uh, um, discussed, but then there have not been on the table of the government. It was not possible for environmental authorities. To, to, to have a jurisdiction, to have a say in the, in the, in the decision process. Um, environmental assessments were terrible, also not reflecting all the propositions on the table. 
um, it's really time to bring in food and consumption. So if you look at Wallonia, this is the Walloon region, actually only 20% of the agriculture area directly produces food from plants for humans. Um, so if you were to grow livestock only from, if you started to, to, to grow livestock only on grass and feed, feed animals with grass, then you would uh, um, probably uh, divide by two the livestock existing in the, in the Walloon uh, region. Um, and then, yeah, it's quite time to phase out harmful subsidies. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emmanuel. We will now next hear from Art Mulders, Senior Advisor at the Dutch Ministry for Agriculture, with a case study from the Netherlands. Thank you. Oh, this is the wrong uh, button. Uh, my name is Art Mulders. I worked uh, as the national coordinator for the Dutch uh, Green Blue Architecture. And I'm now, when Wojciechowski signs the Dutch National Strategic Plan, I will shift towards developing a uh, design for extensifying agriculture in the Netherlands, which is a whole lot of work and very political. Uh, I'm now presenting the ECHO scheme. The ECHO scheme originally was designed to uh, shift from uh, income support towards more a, more, uh, a system which you can pay farmers for ecosystem services. Uh, it depends, of course, on the height of the conditionalities, how much space you have to, uh, to make that shift. Originally, the basic uh, design of the Netherlands is a bit more holistic, where you have the, the AECM and cooperation uh, for the higher levels in the region. That's for, for example, meadow birds, but also in cooperation, we have now the development of peatland and also developing uh, new policies uh, for buffering Natura 2000 areas. You have in, this, in the shift in between, you have a design for a, the AECM, but also the eco scheme supporting, for example, landscape elements, that kind of things. And the lowest level is more or less the basic quality for climate and environment. And there you have the conditionalities uh, as one thing. They are still developing. And it's also peatland uh, for the Netherlands it comes in 2025. We have ideas for that, but we don't have a map. And that makes it difficult to say uh, where the peatlands exactly are. We know some that are low, but not the high ones. Uh, and the AECM, uh, the eco scheme is then really uh, to heighten, make small steps also in the more productive areas, because when these areas are too far from each other, it won't work. You have to, if you want to heighten this, you also have to do something there. Otherwise, the price for a farmer, it will, you can't pay it. In the Netherlands, the difference is more or less 4,000 euros a hectare. So that's why uh, we designed, made this design. And what is then the ECHO scheme? It's a rating system. We designed the rating system together with farmers and together with nature uh, conservation organizations in a discussion, um, how can we make small steps? We made measures in total 21, uh, both for arable land, for uh, grasslands, and non-productive areas. And the trick is, uh, how can you motivate farmers to make small steps and learn new things? It's about also about cultural tra uh, change and about changing the narrative of farmers. Many farmers do something in 30 years and they don't really want to change that. So how do we get them to that change? It's broadly accessible. It's, it's for the platoon, so it has measures, for example, also for wetlands and that kind of things, for the front runners. But the basic idea is this is for the large group. The other designs, the AECM, the cooperation is more for the smaller groups. And then we also have other measures in the cap uh, for the real front runners. And it also helps the farmer to see what, uh, what the effects are of, his, uh, of his, what he is doing in the land. So it also has a learning perspective. And the furthermore, this is also a very important one. 
it should be easy to monitor because it's a large scale uh, thing. And then you have, for example, with uh, area monitoring or with uh, secondary controls, it should be easy for us also as a, as a government. Is it, uh, when it isn't easy, when it costs much time to control, it's vulnerable. So it should be a shared steady system. This is actually what we want to achieve. This is the platoon, and we want to move them to that. We need, I think, the incoming five years of the cap to develop uh, the system in full, and then from the next cap, and then it, you can again make a, a larger step. What is actually the most important thing in the uh, Echo scheme, that's this one. Uh, your, it's a disk of five goals. The goals are climate, soil, and uh, air. This one, water, landscape, and uh, biodiversity. And this one is the steering aspect. Every, we have 21 activities. They are all scored on the, how much uh, they contribute towards uh, one of those five goals. A farmer starts always with the things he does, and, but then he needs extra points. And with this, you ha he has to fulfill them all. Uh, and with this, you push them in a bit more non-productive area, a bit more uh, nitrogen crops, that kind of things. So this is, in, in a way, I have to admit, we avoid a bit the... Uh, it's all calculated on income for gone and cost incurred, but on a farm level, this works different. Because he doesn't calculate the farmer, the things he already does. Those, those are also uh, calculated income for gone and cost incurred. He simply counts how much uh, cost do I have now, how much subsidies do I get, does, is the gap, does that uh, fulfill the costs that I have? In the end, they always all have to have five points per hectare. You get a payment per hectare, which is in the next sheet. You get an average payment per hectare, which is three levels, 60 hect six euros a hectare, 110 and 200. And he has to fulfill eco activities on his farm as a whole uh, to, to fulfill, to get up to the payment. And that's actually this thing. Here, these all have to be green, so he has to have the points, but he also has to come on top of there, or there, or there. This difference is deliberately quite high between silver and gold. What you see also all already in the discussions I have with farmers in the Netherlands, that farmers want to have gold. Uh, so it pushes them, if this was too small, then the step between silver and gold is too small. But when you push them with a larger step, they get ambitious. And, that's, uh, and that helps, of course, because the basic idea always was to see to it that you get a cultural change. The farmers have to think different, and then you can move towards uh, next steps. They have to learn. They have to learn new products. So this, at this moment, uh, the ambition can be higher, it's mostly soil, in this case, soil and water, what we support. But it, uh, I hope and I think that we make a large step with it for the platoon. Then, of course, in the Netherlands we have a lot of other problems which we also have to do, but for that we have some national money. That one. Thank you very much, Art. Last but not least, I'm happy to introduce you to Matti Gurek, EU Policy Officer for Biodiversity and Land, News, Land Use at NABU, Naturschutzbund Deutschland, to sh share a case study from Germany. Thank you. Uh, welcome, everyone. As the last contribution before the break, I will be talking about an eco scheme in the German CSP, which addresses the issue of uh, chemical synthetic pesticides. And it's an issue that needs addressing indeed because over the last 40 years we did not see any decrease uh, in the use of pesticides and the use of more problematic pesticides has even slightly increased and to be clear that is looking at the SAIDS data because we don't actually have the 
the sales data of um, active substances because we do not actually have the data on, on the actual use, which is another issue. As you all know, there is a problem because um, the intensive use of pesticides is um, detrimental to soil health. It is um, uh, contributes to water pollution, and it's uh, one of the main drivers of uh, biodiversity loss, uh, especially pollinators, which you already heard about earlier. And uh, just to, to give an example there, about 550 species of wild bees in Germany, and more than half of them are on the red list. And so what does this eco scheme say? Well, it gives a payment if you don't use any chemical synthetic pesticides. On arable land, that is uh, for the crops, legume, corn, summer cereals, summer canola, vegetables, sugar beet, and potatoes, between January and harvest, at least until the end of August. For permanent crops, um, the same applies, but the dates are different. It's between January and mid of November. Um, in this context, chemical synthetic pesticides are defined as all the pesticides except one, those that are judged low risk according to Article 22 of the Placing on the Market Regulation, and uh, those that are approved for organic farming according to the Organic Products and Labeling Regulation. No, not thank you yet. Ah, it was a step back. <laughs> So how do we assess this eco scheme? Is it actually good, is it bad? And it's actually very hard to generalize here, and that's why I think it serves as a good example. Mm, because the looking at the scheme, of course we welcome that there is such a scheme at all. We think maybe the scope could be extended. I've just shown you what crops it applies to. Maybe it could be also applied to winter crops. Um, but the key issue re really is, will it be competitive? So will it ensure sufficient uptake by the farmers? And that, of course, will depend if uh, the income foregone and uh, expenses spared will be higher than the, or the income foregone, especially reduced yields, will be higher or lower than the payment, including the, the expenses you saved. And this will, in this case, depend mostly on, on three factors. Is uh, the time of sowing, um, what kind of crop you, you're using, and uh, the weather conditions. A very simple example, of course, if there is little or hardly any precipitation, therefore moisture and, um, and water, you will not uh, need as much uh, fungicide, which is the second, uh, high, second most used uh, pesticide in, in Germany in agriculture. So it's really hard to say if the 130 to 169 euros per hectare in the first year and coming years it will be slightly lower, if that will actually be enough. We've talked to some farmers, uh, some are very pessimistic. They said it's the least attractive one in the whole, um, in the whole German CSP. Others said, well, you actually have to differentiate a bit more. There are definitely some cases where this will not be very attractive. Um, others say it really depends if you are not super high use um, a farmer in, in pesticides, it, or if your economic model is not really tailored to, to depend on very high use of pesticides, it might actually be, be economically worthwhile. And another issue is that when calculating these, um, the premium, the, and this is the same case for all large and agriculturally diverse member states, you have to use an average. Now this applies to all of Germany and in various regions the, the conditions will be very different. So if for some reason, if for some region and some crops, it will probably be, be easy money and in others it will be out of the question to, to, to use it. Mm. And um, close with this, a um, short look at the SUR proposal, which is now hotly debated. Um, with the current version of the SUR proposal, we would actually um, would actually allow or which actually change the CSP regulation and would still allow this um, or other like uh, eco schemes to continue to exist because as an exception you can, according to Article 33 of the SUR, um, use eco schemes, ACMs and investment support to comply with, um, with the SUR requirements. Um, but of course the, the, um, the SUR, and this is another more general point on this, um, allows more freedom for, for the member states. So this, as I just showed you, is very very harsh approach. You don't use any chemical synthetic pesticides, and therefore, in, and in return, you get the money. But another approach, of course, would be 
uh, using IPM integrated pest management to lower the use of chemical synthetic pesticides, and there's a great scope in that. And with that, I conclude. Thanks. Thank you very much. Well, with all that we've heard this afternoon, I think uh, you and we all deserve a little coffee break. So um, feel free to grab a drink, coffee or tea, and let's see each other back here facing this direction on the chairs at around 35 past the hour, 4.35. to do the good practices in the short run and in the long run. I don't want him to follow standards. I won't want, want him to do that uh, by himself. But the problem is that we're not fixing the system higher up or lower down, depending on how you look at the system, uh, which is the market, the market conditions, the internalization of externalities, which is not happening. All kinds of, of, of regulations which are not yet in place. Uh, you know, it's... it's uh, and are really, really necessary to make it happen. That this creates a lot of tension at the farmer, as you actually just explained. You know, the farmer is squeezed by these standards on the one hand, but the market conditions that are not following on the other. Thank you. Do we have reactions to that? Like for me? Um, with the mic, please. Some of the questions which uh, were raised. Um, so I think. Uh, for example, on, on coupling on support, I think there is uh, there also a push towards uh, more sustainability as well. And it's not only about livestock, it's also about uh, supporting other crops, which are also important in, in times of food security. On public goods, it depends what is public goods. There are many things that farmers deliver. Even the fact that they produce food for our food security, I think it's a public good. And uh, we are talking about food security globally. We are not talking food security only in the EU, but in the EU we are talking about price afford and affordability of food. So we are still uh, in a situation where this is important. And farmers are there also. If the farmers are not there, if the CAP uh, is not there, uh, let's remember that then all the GAECs, so the good agricultural uh, conditions would not be there. So they are there to, pr to produce the food, to keep the rural areas alive, and by being there and by participating in the CAP support, they also deliver on the basic uh, conditions which I mentioned before, which are strengthened compared to the previous CAP. I would also uh, echo what Eric has just said, um, but I'd like to, to react just to the idea that producing food might be a public good because I think going down that route is, is quite dangerous. Uh, then we could also start subsidizing bike manufacturers and, I don't know, heat <laughs> heating systems manufacturers because having heat in your house is, is also important and, and a human right, etc. No, like, producing food is the economic activity of farmers and as economic actors, they need to be regulated um, to some extent. But indeed, we need to send them the right economic signals. And it's quite clear that this cap is falling short of sending them the right signals because they will still be getting subsidies just to have land. They will still be getting coupled subsidies to grow protein crops and a variety of crops to, to rear livestock um, instead of addressing the potential market failures that are leading to this support being needed or instead of actually enabling a transition isn't it crazy when every scientific study shows that we need to reduce livestock number in Europe, that we are still helping farmers keep numbers of, of livestock stable? Um, it just makes absolutely no sense from, from an environmental perspective. Um, but maybe just so also comment on, on, on one thing from earlier. Um, what we try to do with this report is to go beyond the surface, because especially with this new cap and the new delivery model, it is very clear that we can't just say things like, okay, now there is enhanced conditionality. No, it, it, that doesn't mean anything because we need to look at what is being implemented by, by member states. I'm sure that we agree on this. And so that's really what we tried to do. We didn't do justice to the level of detail that is included in the report in our 10 minute presentation earlier, because you can't, it's <laughs> extremely complex and the situation varies from one country to another. But so it's the same for this crop rotation gag, for example, the way you define crop rotation, 
the exemptions that you put in place, for example, on the size of the farm, etc., uh, will influence whether actually farmers are, are obliged to do it. And what we see is that, by and large, what looks green on paper is not being translated as an actual change in practices on the ground. And the same goes with the, the percentages that, that we hear, like half of the EU agricultural area will be covered by a measure for biodiversity or soil or whatever. But what are those measures? This is meaningless if those measures just pay for very simple basic practices that don't actually make an, an improvement. So that's what we're trying to do with the report. And I, yeah, I hope that we can go beyond also the sort of very high level slogans and, and, and try and bring more nuance to the, rep to the, to the debate with, with the research that we have done. Because we, I think any, anything that's too generic saying the cap is green is, is no, <laughs> it doesn't work anymore. We need to look beyond that. Thank you. Um, Thomas, the, it's been alluded to the new delivery model. So it's leaving more freedom to member states to pursue EU ob objectives in their own way. So what is your, object, uh, your assessment uh, of it, especially in light of so some of what we've heard here today? So um, does it affect um, disparities among mem uh, create disparities among member states? Does it negatively affect quality of spending? Yeah, I mean, it, it really very much depends on, on what country we're looking at. Uh, and there's really big differences between countries, how ambitious they are also in, in, in uh, applying the, let's say, mechanisms and tools that the new cap offers. Um, and maybe just to, may that, that may be a surprise to you, but maybe in defense of the commission, sure, you have to defend everything here now. But in fact, how I actually perceived it is that uh, the commission is very ambitious with a lot of policies that I have put forward. We're now discussing the sustainable use directive. The question is, how will we actually imply that into the common agriculture policy? And how will we make member states actually changing or amending the, the national plans to actually make that happen in practice on the ground. Also, the farm to fork strategy points in the right direction. But there's also reasons why, especially our conservative friends, made sure that the cap is decided before the Green Deal gets published. So they do not actually have to apply all these principles in all the density uh, and intensity also to the common agriculture policy. And I think you, we can also admit that. And I'm, I may do that instead of you, uh, if, uh, because you, by profession, have to defend. Yeah? But, but so, so it's, it's it's, it's interesting because we're, we're actually working and standing much closer in trying to turn agriculture towards green, uh, green delivery than it seems. But the delivery model as such, I mean, it's a distraction of the common market. And I understand that the commission was just fed up of getting all the blame all the time from all the farmers, you know, for all the bureaucracy and so on. In, in the truth is, you know, what the farmer actually, the piles of paper you get to fill out are actually created by your agricultural ministry and not by the European Commission. And by, you know, now saying, okay, we're just setting the goals and you make the rules in your agricultural, uh, 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 agricultural ministry and then you also take the blame for bureaucracy or whatever. I, I can understand that, but still. I mean, it's a common market. It's, it, it's supposed to serve uh, also the, the competitiveness within. And now we're actually putting countries that are more ambitious at stake. At actually, we're putting them into an unfair competition and through this, actually countering the actual goals that we're having uh, through CAP. That, that's, that's what I see happening. And I think it's, it's a mistake that we went down that road uh, to actually uh, well, allow all member states to, to diverge so much in the actual uh, funding schemes. And, and you mentioned it earlier uh, that uh, second pillar is co-financed. So for a country like Austria, Germany, or Netherlands, uh, so let's say the more rich countries, uh, it's relatively easy to say, okay, we co-finance a 50% but especially for the least or less wealthy countries, but which are the ones that we have to look at more. I mean, go to Romania or Bulgaria and see what's going on there on the major landscapes, fields like 1,000 hectares. We, 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 we fail to limit the size of, of hectares uh, that, that we can apply cup fundings on. Uh, so we c we're still funding fields with 2,000 hectares, one field, one monoculture, that this is a devastation to environment to, to, to in, in, all, in all kinds. That's clear. You know it. I know it. We didn't, we weren't able to push it through. Or that we limit actually fundings uh, when it comes to, to animal husbandry, uh, to, uh, to put it in a certain relation to land that you have. Yeah? 
uh, we failed with that. And we both tried, commission tried, we tried in parliament, uh, partly even parliament's position was working like that, but in council we failed on doing that. Uh, and so the, the, the general standards are, uh, let's say, have so many loopholes uh, and, and then combine it uh, with the new delivery model uh, is, is, is really uh, allowing the member states to basically subsidize what they like. Uh, and this can be in the case of uh, Czech Republic, uh, Babish likes Babish, yeah? In the case of uh, uh, Hungary, Orban likes his 10 best friends. And in the case of some other few countries, they really like their environment and their small scale farming uh, that they still have. And they put this, the, the, the money there. They can, they have the possibility within the new cap, that's true. So if you wanna be ambitious as a country, you can be. But if you don't want to be, you just further invest into, yeah, uh, 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 let's say, the old school stuff. And this puts the countries that are more ambitious in a very difficult situation when it comes to the market, because we all have to compete on the same market for the same prices, and that's then rather difficult. Thank you very much. Thanks, uh, Thomas, for wanting to speak on my behalf, <laughs> but I can do it myself. So just to come back to some of the points you made on the, on the new delivery model. I think it's uh, really a game changer in a way, and it's, uh, it's uh, uh, bringing forward a feature which uh, we were already starting to have in the, in the previous EP. It's really about uh, um, looking at the conditions on the ground, because one size doesn't fit all, and we know it, we are now too big uh, to do everything here from Brussels. I think we needed member states to look at their needs, uh, to look at uh, necessary um, uh, interventions in their uh, places to devise the strategy and to come up with that uh, to the Commission. And then we still have a very strong role. I mean, the, um, the commonality of the policy is really there. We have a strong uh, framework, which the Parliament also adopted uh, together with the co-legislators. So um, I think it's, um, it's a strong policy, which has strong uh, uh, commonality. And with CAP, uh, CAP plans, which are adopted uh, by the Commission, which is also guardian of uh, the respect of the different uh, elements of the legal, uh, legal framework. Uh, where I agree, um, um, as well with Celia and with Thomas, is that we need now to look at the implementation phase. So this is very important. Indeed, what we have in the plans, um, it's, uh, it's written there, but now from 1st of January, we want to see member states implementing and we will monitor that and we can come back to that later. So it's going to be very strongly followed by, by the commission and uh, we'll of course look at it and uh, intervene where necessary. Thank you. One thing I was just wondering when I was reading the report is uh, what missing, and maybe you can you can answer that is when when I, I get the delivery model, but to what extent does that promote or hinder policy cohesion and coherence at that level? Because the cap is not the only policy. Again, there are dozens and dozens of, of regulations and acts that that need to be coherent with each other. And so my question is, you know, does does that delivery model increase or decrease the coherence? Uh, from the angle of the Commission, certainly the new delivery model with a strong legal framework which we ask member states to respect and which we are vigilant because we approve the plans, we respect and we, uh, we safeguard uh, this coherence. And this coherence within, with the legal framework of the common agricultural policy, but also outside. And you touch a very important point, the coherence with all the other policies. Not only environmental policy, also cohesion policy, and so on and so forth. And this is something which the Commission, when uh, assessing the plants and adopting them, the plants has been very careful in, uh, in safe safeguarding. I would disagree, <laughs> as you could have expected. Um, no, our assessment has been that um, it depends what you look at, but in terms of the coherence with the Green Deal, the new delivery model has tied the Commission's hands. The Green Deal was only a political ambition, it, it wasn't a legal framework when the cap was being negotiated, and member states have rejected uh, or refused to integrate really its key ambitions clearly in the legal framework of the cap, and so it means that now, as the Commission was reviewing the cap strategic plans, all it could do was ask nicely and, and hope that member states accept to do something. But the result from what we've seen on the result indicators, on the measures, is that we won't have a 50% reduction in pesticides, 20% reduction in fertilizer use, we won't have 10% space for nature by 2030 with this cap. 
then there's a big question of policy coherence with national legislation, which is both emanating from EU legislation and from other uh, national legislation. And there, um, our assessment has been that the, the legal framework of the cap is too weak. It refers to EU environmental legislation, for example. It asks uh, member states to involve their environmental authorities, but it hasn't really change the way that things work enough to really make that link strongly enough. So it has really relied on member states having the goodwill to talk with their environmental counterparts, to, to link up between agriculture, between envi and environment and social policies, etc. cetera. Um, but, but the way that the legal framework is set up really still enables the, the agricultural authorities to keep doing their own thing without necessarily fully integrating EU environmental uh, regulations, whether water framework directive, etc. Thank you, Celia. Um, I would like to stay with you. So we've heard um, the report, and overall, would you say that the new cap is a step in the right direction, albeit a very small one, or how would you characterize and summarize that? Um, so. I think what Thomas said at the beginning is the key here. It's, it depends what you compare it with. If you compare the current cap with the previous cap, it is an improvement. But if you compare the, the new cap with, with what we need to do, it's nowhere near enough. Um, and especially in the light of, of the Green Deal, uh, the Commission promised a man on the moon moment, but this is not a man on the moon cap. I mean, if anything, maybe a hot air balloon, but you know, that won't get us to the moon, that's for sure. So it's, it's just as, as the conclusion that I made earlier, it's too little and much too slowly for the crisis that we have. That, that is our assessment in, in a nutshell. Thank you. Can I? So um, I noted, however, that in the presentations which were made, uh, Several points were actually positive. You mentioned that there are positive measures on livestock uh, within uh, the, the general uh, criticism you have on that. Peatland, wetland, uh, positive developments on biodiversity, soil and water. So I noted that very <laughs> carefully, these positive elements. I think um, at the end, the, the CEP is um, a well-balanced um, result. Uh, as I said before, I'm in charge of the three aspects of sustainability, so we need to look at this holistically, and I think we have advanced on competitiveness for farmers, uh, long-term viability, also redistribution and targeting to, to smaller farms, so we have uh, made step forward in the, in the um, environmental and uh, uh, climate ambition on the social aspect, social conditionality for the first time in the, in the CAP, and also in terms of uh, farm advisory, uh, training, knowledge, which is essential also for this uh, ecological transition of farmers. Yeah, but now, now looking at it from the other perspective, we're in a massive climate crisis. The whole society has to review its models of life, of transport, of, of how we feed ourselves, how we produce, how our industry functions, how we heat our homes. We have to review all of that to reduce emissions. And then we have a sector, like together with forestry, which is a diff different topic we could also debate here, but, but we have a sector that would have the potential to not just emit less, but actually sequest CO2 into the soil. And you, you say, well, we have these carbon farming measures. Well, if you talk to science, these carbon farming measures are not worth a lot until now uh, because basically, I mean, you can, what, what do we measure? The amount of carbon that was put into the soil in one year? I mean, if you just do one wrong, um, one wrong action on your field you, uh, and re-emit it all into the atmosphere. So we, we have a sector that would have been able to actually uh, sequest CO2, get CO2 out of the atmosphere, and we clearly have not uh, uh, captured the full potential that agriculture would have had in this regard. In a sector, and I would say the only sector, that is basically fully dependent on subsidies. You know, it's actually for policymakers, this is, f this is paradise. Because whatever you decide, you know, I basically the farmers will do what they get subsidies for. 
Uh, it's so easy it is. Because we are all, and I, I, I say that for myself as well, we're dependent on subsidies. The reality is that we produce produce for fairly, uh, maybe the production costs are less than that, and the actual income that we have is the subsidies. I know it depends on what kind of farm and in what country, but basically you can say that. So this, is, uh, this gives us the possibility to actually steer, to direct the whole sector, because we have all the mechanisms and all the kind of power in hand. And unfortunately, we, we didn't use the full potential that we have and that we still see. Uh, but still, I mean, you know, uh, before the cap or after the cap negotiations is before the cap negotiations, and we will have a review in 2024. And I think we should measure ourselves not from where we're coming from, but rather what the potential the, the sector would have in terms of uh, uh, climate protection, but also biodiversity protection. Clearly, I just focused on climate now. And I think this is the perspective from where we should debate. What potential does it have? And, and by the way, uh, also long-term food security depends on the amount of humus carbon in the soil. Water retention depends on that. So it's a question about drought. It's a question about floods. You know, I, I Just look all these. And this is the public goods I am talking about in the first regard. And this is well combinable with food security, long-term food security, also in times of extreme weather, in times of global warming. You know the potential, we know it, I know it, we both know it. We need to fight you know, for, for maximum implementation of, of these environmental standards. And I think there we, are, we, are, we have different positions, uh, but there, there we, we should be united. And, and also in, in voicing you know, the potential that it has uh, uh, and kind of, yes, taking the different perspectives from the potential side and not from, let's say, the rather bad situation that where we're coming from. That would be my proposal. Thank you. Yes, you can applaud. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much. So we've definitely heard different viewpoints now on the current cap and its implementation. Um, I would like us to turn our focus into the future now and explore the vision uh, for the next cap, so post-2027, uh, including, let's say, maybe some ideas for concrete policy recommendations. So I would like to ask um, Silvia, with um, the arguments that we have heard about the disparities between member states' implementation and funds continuing to flow to, let's say, the usual uh, beneficiaries, um, what is your assessment of the directions that conversations are now taking for a cap post-2027? Well, today we adopted two more plans of this coming CAP, so uh, we are really fully in, into the, the mode of finalizing the, the cap plans and implementing the cap plans, as you were said also before. So uh, this is really uh, our priority. But this being said, of course, it's good also to project ourselves uh, uh, in the future. And uh, indeed, as you said, uh, as you mentioned, there will be a report uh, um, end of next year where we will look at the, the efforts uh, made uh, in, the in re regard to the ambitions in the Green Deal in particular, but not only. So this will be an important stepping stone, of course, of the, of the reflections. Then we will also have in uh, early 2024 uh, a report on the rural areas. We have the long-term vision for rural areas, which requires that, look at what was achieved and uh, what can be uh, done more. Then we are looking also at uh, uh, the strategy for plant protein. So mm, there are many initiatives which I'm sure will trigger also a debate, a policy debate, and then there will be events like this one. Uh, so we will need to see how the, the reflections will be shaped, but uh, it's clear from what also was said today and from what we are leaving that there will be some elements which will be very much there, like uh, food security, uh, like uh, uh, moving forward on the Green Deal, uh, the sustainability, the resilience of the agricultural sector. So I would imagine that these will be the themes which will be discussed, and when the time will come, there will be uh, stakeholders consultation and foresight accompanying the reflections. Do we have any reactions to that from the panel? I trust my colleagues. Okay. <laughs> well, um, Eric, uh, as you've mentioned uh, and alluded to earlier, attempts to make uh, the cap work for the environment go back to, let's say, the 80s or so. Um, some even argue that the cap is unreformable. Um, what's your assessment of that stance? What would it take to truly bring transformation in farming? Yeah, the problem of, of path dependency or the layering, as policy uh, scientists are saying, is, is really problematic. Eh? So you put 
layer on layer on layer on layer and nothing ever you know disappears and and so in the end you you create a monstrous policy framework which uh, makes it more and more complex to make it coherent and consistent not only with the, the acts that we're talking about now but I'm also thinking about uh, the net zero uh, strategy that we will have to adopt. I mean, supermarkets are already, and, and food companies are already asking farmers, you know, what is your net zero uh, strategy? Is it, do you have one? Are you, are you in there? Uh, the Green Claims Initiative, uh, the PEF, does it stop at, at farming? You know, we don't have a framework in agriculture to, to measure sustainability. There is a food law coming up next year, maybe. Uh, you know, but so 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 this 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 uh, pressure from society, from from supply chain actors, uh, as you were saying, will increase more and more. But we are still looking at the cap as a supply side thing. You know, it's a farmer thing. That's why it's called cap, of course. But you know, a real food system, a common food system policy, requires that you integrate demand and su with supply side uh, issues, and that's you know. Like if you would ask me, uh, you know, what about steps in the other European policy? Well, it's the same thing, you know. The European, what is it, uh, the Food Information uh, Directive? Same thing, you know. Oh, we're going to do something with Nutri-Score. We're not going to call it Nutri-Score, uh, but we're doing it anyway. But we're not going to say anything about food compo com composition. So the thing that we are saying here is happening, of course, in all areas of the European Union. It's not unique to agriculture, but, but it's also happening in other s parts of the food system. And we need action at all these parts to accelerate in the same direction. Thank you. Um, Thomas, what do, you, what do you think? You've mentioned intentions and objectives, and, and yet the climate um, and biodiversity crisis keep deepening. Do you see any fundamental changes on the horizon? Would you say we need more efforts to improve implementation or another reform attempt or something radically different? And if so, what? For the future prospects, the, the bigger hope I, 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 in the moment I have on other policies and other legislative proposals that come from the Green Deal, actually. I, I, I pointed out on, on the Sustainable Use Directive already. Uh, so if, even if the cap is not fit to bring us a substantial reduction in pesticides, uh, Sustainable Use Directive can. And even if, if the cap is not bringing us enough substance in, in reduction of artificial fertilizer use, as an example, uh, a serious um, um, enforcement of water framework directive brings us that or can bring us that. Uh, if, we, if we look at the policies that stem from farm to fork strategy, I mean, there's a lot of, a lot of true, true and, 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 and helpful stuff in there to regionalize food supply. Uh, to, to, uh, which, which makes us more independent, so to more focus actually, as, as you mentioned now, on, on the whole supply chain, yeah? uh, uh, to reduce uh, transportation of food. But it, it this also means making our farming and food systems more resilient also from international shocks. I mean, what we've seen now yeah, uh, is, is, is you, you see how, how volatile food markets today is since we have made them commodities, the main foodstuff commodities that are traded on stock exchange and not just traded there, but you are speculated on. That's one of the main problems. So, so but also there, I, I hope on other policies, uh, but also if we look into um, the competition that we're bringing ourselves in, in, in the world wild to kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, interlinkage. I personally, but that's my personal opinion, I think it was, a, it was a major mistake already in the 80s to actually change the agricultural subsidy system to, a, let's say, adaptation to the world markets. Because what we're basically doing is we're having farmers producing for world market prices, which you can't in the European Union, so why, that's why we have to give them an income through public money, just so we can perform on the world market. That which leads to being Europe the biggest agricultural importer and exporter at the same time. Just the problem is, uh, if I relate it to, to animal husbandry, the problem is not just that we, we pay with Amazon forest for that, but all the manure stays here, the sting stays here, and the, and the, and the, and the nitrogen stays here. So to also rethink this uh, uh, um, or in regards, uh, but there we also have interesting trade policies, due diligence as an example, uh, 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 the, to, to go against deforestation in the produce. So, so I have more hopes on improving uh, different 
parts of the legislation that are related to agriculture through other environmental policies uh, and through even trade policies uh, where, where I think we, we have in the moment the better leverage to push agriculture into the right direction and then kind of maybe try to follow up with the subsidy schemes uh, in cap. I mean, we have the review in 24, if I rightly so recall. So I, I think we can, we, and we can through implementation of the other legislation, push member states to amend their national strategy plans to actually fulfill uh, through cap fundings what they ha have are obliged to or have promised uh, through other policies like also uh, uh, a reduction of emissions, uh, CO2 emissions, uh, uh, so climate neutrality and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, more, that's where I have more hope now, so on energy, uh, also energy policies and so on. Uh, well, also there we have to watch out that we don't uh, step into all too many traps when it comes to bioenergy, biofuel and so on. And also review also the use that we, that how we use actually foodstuffs today. Uh, now it's a cheap commodity that we produce with, okay, artificial fertilizer, pesticides, on the, on, and we pay for this uh, with environment, with soil health, uh, with, with public health, uh, and this commodity then we use 20% of the crop production of European Union to put it into our tanks as fuel, yeah? Like also review this kind of uh, policies. So this is where I have more hope. Yeah. So we've, we've have, you've spoken a lot about markets uh, and, and policies. I'm actually curious about the economist's view who shared earlier that he doesn't like standards. How will the market fix this? Yes, and, and, and then of course I'm going to say I like trade, <laughs> <laughs> which I do. Um, I mean, trade, uh, I'm not going to do in, in too much detail, that, but from a global perspective, you know, trade was good for food security, trade is good for nutrition, trade is good for having all people all over the world have access to to healthy lifestyles and healthy eating. And of course also the opposite, right? <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's both, uh, but it's also, uh, I mean, we can't do without trade. And maybe Europe can, but the rest of the world cannot. But I want to uh, suggest a reframing. Rather than saying that other policies will have to push agriculture and farmers to do, please say other policies help farmers enabling what they want to do anyway, because the Dutch representatives said they all want to be gold. If that's the intrinsic motivation, we don't have to push farmers, we have to enable them. So please, you know, reframe it, because that's what farmers currently, you know, most of the farmers are looking at these policies, these are constraining us, and they should be enabling them. Well, I don't know, the way that we see it is that the other policies set the targets and the rules, but the cap needs to enable. If we're talking, depending how we enable farmers, but generally it's by giving them the financial means to sure. take risks, to to adopt new practices which will cost them, then that the biggest pot of money for this is in the cap. And so it is true, I, I, we in the EB share uh, your view, Thomas, that other policies, other legislation are needed to set the, the boundaries for what is acceptable in terms of pesticides use, in terms of greenhouse gas emissions, air quality, etc., etc. And these are binding obligations that come on farmers and the cap needs to be there to support them. But we're not seeing that this is exactly happening uh, so far. Although, yeah, we, we, <laughs> we can agree to disagree, but our assessment is that it's not. Telegraphically, because I know that uh, we're almost there. Uh, I just wanted to say that I, I agree when you talk about the framework uh, for the sustainable food uh, systems. So we need to look at this uh, holistically indeed. And also with the concept of resilience, uh, I, I, I certainly agree that we need to look at that uh, very carefully. And I also agree on the enabling farmers. I think this is really a very good point uh, because you know when we talk about pesticides, uh, they, they want to have alternatives for pesticides. They need to be there for them to be able to, uh, to go step forward. So it's really about finding the solutions for them and the farmers are the first one to suffer from extreme weather events, from loss of biodiversity, from uh, bad quality of water and so on and so forth and they want to be gold uh, and we need to help them to be, to be gold indeed. And then just a, a small uh, precision, there will be a report end of next year on the, um, the lessons learned from the, the cap plants, uh, from what we have in the cap plants, but there will not be a review. Member states will always be able to amend the plants according to the, the needs and the lessons learned. Thank you. Um, Celia, I'd like to address a question to you. So 
You've been um, arguing through your report um, for public money for public goods, so um, subsidies going um, to high quality um, uh, agri-environment measures and stopping harmful um, subsidies. And judging from your report, um, there is uh, a lot of room for improvement because that has not been um, achieved. How will this affect your campaigning work? Um, in you know, you said this is what we're trying to do with the report. How do you view the years ahead for for you as as an NGO sector, let's say? Um, I guess one thing to be said here is that um, we we very much want our demands and our campaigning work, as you call it, to be based on evidence, and that's why we actually took the time, made the effort to look at those plans uh, with uh, support from our members and partners in, in 16 countries, 17 regions. Um, and that can then inform us in, in shaping the demands for what needs to be different. Um, so it, it's very important for us that we draw lessons from what has worked and what hasn't, and we then change. Um, one thing maybe to be said is that uh, it's not clear that the, the slogan public money for public good really has worked. Uh, it seems to create a lot of confusion and then we get stuck in debates about what are public goods. Is producing food a public good? Uh, I would like to get the, the view from the agricultural economist on this. <laughs> I would suspect not. Um, it's a market good, we, we pay for food. But we don't pay enough, um, that's clear. But no, one thing I'd like to say on, um, on the next cap is that um, uh, a big failure of this current one is that it is making very, very small steps in the right direction when we need to make huge leaps. And the science is clear, the, the environmental conditions are telling us we need to make s huge changes. Um, and the IPCC has told us we have until, well, they said 2030, now they've actually brought it down. We, we just need to cut emissions now. And so if that transition is not happening before 2027, then it will need to happen even faster afterwards. Essentially, the, the, the fact that this cap is so, so stuck on path dependency means that the next one will have to do double as much. Um, and so it, it, it's creating a situation where campaigners will have to have even more radical demands and uh, farmers will probably feel quite scared of the change ahead. And so we really need to try and bridge that gap, try and, and find a solution where we can address the, the huge crises and do so at the urgency that is needed, while also recognizing that we need to take everyone with us and, and find a narrative for a positive f future for, for agriculture, for food, and for the cap. Um, and I would also want to agree very much with um, what's been said around about also taking agriculture out of its silo and out of its small box. We, we need to look at the whole system um, and that means also reshaping what we spend money on in terms of maybe not spending money on food types that we need to be eating less of, like sugar beet, for example, just to name one, um, and, and really aligning uh, the way we spend this public money with our environmental and health and social objectives. So. Some some thoughts here, but uh, our thinking is still in its early days for the next cap. But it's clear that it will be speeding up in, in the next months. Thank you, Celia. I am wondering whether the um, coffee and delicious juices have inspired any questions from the audience um, to our panelists. Is there? Okay, great. I see one question. Thank you. Um, very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Paula Gürtler. I work as a research assistant at the Center for European Policy Studies, and I'm involved in a project on new technologies and agriculture. Um, now, I'm not here to advocate for tech solutionism, um, and I noticed that we have sidetracked this discussion on new technologies as a solution to many of the problems in our agricultural sector with the first um, presentation already, but I'm still curious if there is a space for digital technologies in particular for the um, agricultural sector, and if so, what do we need to consider there? Thank you.
Thank you very much. So uh, indeed, this is actually um, a part of one of uh, the objectives of the Common Agricultural Policy, uh, to go uh, towards more uh, innovation, use of new technologies. Uh, well, precision farming is not new, but it's there and it's, it's growing. Uh, it's about you know connectivity, and this links up to what I said at the beginning about um, also rural areas. If we have connectivity in rural areas, the farmers can uh, move uh, towards the technology even faster. And we are uh, working a lot on innovation, uh, and on this one uh, we are um, pairing up uh, science with uh, and linking science with farmers so that they can use more quickly uh, what comes from the science on the ground. And we are working in the European Innovation Partnership with operational groups which are very active. There are, I think, around 3,000 of them around Europe, and this is really something on which to which we attach a lot of attention. We are also um, pushing for ambition also on the ground in terms of implementation. Well, after your intervention, I can start with a small disagreement. Um, digitalization, or let's say precision farming, precision farming per se is not an eco scheme. Precision farming doesn't say anything as long as we don't know what actually we're talking about. It's not an eco scheme. So that's one of the major faults, uh, uh, but, but, but it's part of uh, the eco schemes uh, in, in CAP. But, but pr uh, precision farming is also not always linked to connectivity. It's not always linked to internet. Th there we see what kind of precision farming you are thinking about. I have other proposals. So the, uh, the, the innovation part is super, super interesting for agriculture, but it's also a tricky part. I give you some examples. To have a drone that drops, uh, uh, what is it, uh, mites, uh, uh, predator mites, uh, every 10 meters in a, in a clay ball, flying over field and replacing pesticides through that, perfect thing, yeah? perfect innovation. That's how we can really replace pesticides and that's how we can use techniques. Also, a drone is something that is affordable for nearly every farmer and even if it's two or three small farmers buying one together, perfect match. I have been and I've, I've uh, w visited a startup that is actually ha uh, pr uh, programming an app that you can put to your tractor, and even if it's an old tractor, a tracker, uh, with, a, with a mechanical weeding uh, device in, uh, in the back, which actually allows uh, uh, the farmer to weed even three cultures, so a threefold culture where three different crops are growing on one single field, to, to weed it mechanically up to one centimeter close to the line. Perfect solution, let's go for it. Uh, so there's a lot out there which makes sense. Uh, or um, no-till without glyphosate, with technical solutions, with technical uh, mechanical weeding, uh, even new strategies to, to prevent, uh, you know, that you're actually closing off the soil from water and, 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 and air. So there's a lot of innovation out there. And I'm actually, I'm Meanwhile, super pissed on some of my uh, conservative colleagues that they deny that even in conventional agriculture, there's so many good examples of good solutions, innovative solutions that are based on, on, on research and so on. But when it comes to precision farming, meaning that I'm basically selling myself out to BISF, that actually uh, I buy a new tracker that is linked to the satellite, where the satellite tells me on which part of soil I should apply whatever fertilizer, and where the satellite actually uh, collects all the data, and then I'm bound to BSF because they give me the seeds, they give me the tracker, they give me the seeds, they give me the, the pesticides, they also tell me when to apply what, and they even give me a contract then to buy my, my, my grains. And if I ever want to change the company, I have to pay, if they allow me to, I have to pay BSF for the data of my very own land, then I'm a bit starting to be critical uh, uh, that we also have to be aware that under the framework of precision farming, it's also a strategy to basically make us farmers simple tracker drivers, yeah? uh, uh, on, and, uh, but still us carrying the risk, uh, especially in times of climate change and global warming and, and, and pests and so on. So there I'm getting skeptical a bit. Uh, so there's a lot positive in it, but there's a I think there's some dangers. So if we talk about precision farming, digitalization, innovation, we always, always have to look into the actual concrete proposal. And I didn't touch new uh, GMOs here because this would kind of grant us a whole de own debate, I would say, a whole evening uh, to debate that. I didn't touch upon that. Yeah, we will have the networking drinks at 6, so maybe that's, a, uh, that's one to dive into. More questions here, yeah? Uh, my
my question is uh, to um, Ms. Michelini. Um, because you've uh, mentioned repeatedly uh, evidence. But then I must say I was a bit disappointed with the fact that you gave us a lot of slogans that I can agree to, but not much engagement with the evidence that we have actually presented. So I will just pick one. The Walloon graph that shows that the plan that you have just approved pays farmers basically the more animals they have, the more money they receive in a region where we have way too many animals. And not only the more animals you have, the more money you get, but the new CAP is worse than the old CAP. Because in the old CAP, you kind of, it, it, you know, there was the a bend in the curve, and now there is a much more, um, you know, uh, stronger correlation between, between money and animals. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, and I'm sure that you will be uh, understanding that I, I couldn't um, reply on the spot to something which was just presented uh, half an hour ago. Uh, but I will be very interested in reading the full report uh, um, once it's there, and uh, certainly um, we will learn a lot uh, from that. I think the livestock issue is a, is a complex one in the sense that uh, we cannot uh, reduce ourselves just to you know, reducing uh, livestock um, uh, numbers. I think it's much more than that. I think we need to look at, uh, um, at the different approaches which have been chosen by the member states with regard to the livestock um, sector. Uh, we shouldn't uh, forget that uh, livestock is closely related to permanent grassland. So if we want also permanent grassland to continue, we still also need a uh, livestock sector alive and uh, also we need, to, we need to look also at the different types of systems, whether it's an intensive, whether it's extensive system. So I don't think we, need, we can simply you know, generalize. Uh, we need to look at the different situations and circumstances in the, in, in the different member states. And we will certainly look uh, um, uh, carefully at what was presented this afternoon in the, in the presentation uh, showing the different trends and uh, yeah, uh, subject to further reflection. But what I want to say is that it's not a simple, uh, there is no simple uh, and uh, univocal answer to such a question. Thank you. So we have time for one last uh, qu qu questions. Yeah, a quick one. So I see a hand over there. Thank you so much for a fascinating discussion. I'm Giorgio Rodechesco, researcher at the University of Sheffield. In many areas of Eastern Europe and Mediterranean Europe, we see land abandonment as a symptom of rural decline and the decline of marginal agriculture and subsistence agriculture. <coughs> Rewilders and proponents of rewilding see this as an opportunity for switching some of the payments from agriculture and marginal agriculture to rewilding uh, processes. Do you think that this could happen in the current cap or in the next cap to switch some of the subsidies from marginal agriculture towards living nature to its own devices, like rewilder, rewilding proponents? Is there anyone in particular that you're addressing the question to? Is uh, yes, to uh, Mrs. Silvia Michelini. Thank you. So um, I think already with this uh, DCAP, we have some um, elements of that. Huh? You see that, uh, uh, for example, in terms of uh, um, uh, um, land out of production uh, with, the, with the cap plants which we have now, we are reaching around uh, three million hectares uh, which are left out of production. So for, uh, you know, with more uh, um, landscape feature and with additional elements of landscape feature. So I think it's a step in the right uh, direction. Uh, then we have also um, uh, member states who have proposed even more to go beyond uh, this baseland which is, uh, which is already existing and which is strengthened as compared to before. Uh, then you have uh, the, um, the initiative which was presented uh, recently about the nature restoration law, which is uh, an important component there. So I think we are moving toward, towards that direction also to, to see where this is possible to reclaim land uh, uh, to nature. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. This has been very, very interesting. Um, to close this off, I would like to ask each of you in a rapid fire session, if you were to summarize 
in one word. And you can choose whether you want to focus on the event today, on the CAP's future, on food security's future. You each get to pick one word that you take away from today into tomorrow and beyond. Easy, huh? It can be a fear. It can be. No, no, it, it, it can only be progress. Towards moving on. Too gradual. <laughs> Unavoidable. <laughs> Unavoidable. Thank you very much. Let's give it up for our panel. Thank you. Ah, no, you can leave them there. So there is only one and a half things between us and the network drinks. I would like to welcome Mr. Maciej Golubiewski, head of cabinet of the Commissioner for Agriculture, um, who is here with us today uh, to deliver a closing keynote speech. Welcome. Welcome. Where do I do this? Here, sit down, up, so, okay. I'll sit down since I have a few notes. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the invitation. I was, I was uh, glad that you wanted me to come half an hour before so that I could listen a little bit to the conversation. So that gave me some clues about uh, where we are. Uh, it's interesting as I come, as I go around the town with Commissioner and Sylvia and everyone else, trying to sum up the year. It's very interesting, depending on the audience and the organization or the st nature of the stakeholders, <laughs> how different the, the uh, let's say, the judgment on the cap or, 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 or what's going on in agricultural policy is. I was a few days ago with some uh, US stakeholders uh, who are now visiting uh, Brussels for our um, uh, platform on agriculture, cooperative platform agriculture initiative, and they, they've come in, in large numbers. And when we talk to them, uh, when they talk to us about the cap, they say, uh, we are horrified by your excessive uh, ambitions, regulatory ambitions, that will do away with our farming models and they will destroy your agriculture and your ideas about maximum residue levels and all this stuff. This is, this is just, uh, you're doing it to protect your farmers because you really want to ramp up those standards that are just unbelievably high and, uh, and, uh, and we won't, won't be able to keep up. So we have that perspective. Then I go to the European farmers and the European farmers are saying, like I heard a few minutes ago, look, we are completely constrained we, there are costs imposed on us. Those standards from farm to fork by diversity are killing us. Uh, you need to relax. We have a food crisis. You need to do something about it. And by the way, all this external policy that you'd like to impose on the world, there's no way it will happen. We don't believe it will happen. You don't have the tools as the European Commission or the European Union to impose all those, all those uh, let's say, uh, ideas like mirror clauses and things like that on the outside world, so it will fail it will just completely lose with the competition and they will add on the Mercosur discussions on top of this and all this stuff. So, so <laughs> and then I come here and, and I get uh, another uh, negative opinion saying, well, we're not ambitious enough. Uh, the cap has not really done anything with the farm to fork, fork uh, aspirations. It's other legislation and, uh, and the cap is kind of it's business as usual. So it's, it's, I don't know if it's good or bad, it's a little bit, uh, I don't know, a, little, a little bit unnerving that everybody's so unhappy. Um, some people say in the policy circles that if everybody's unhappy, that means that the compromise is good. But I've always been very skeptical about this approach. But, uh, but well, I heard that there's been improvement, at least, so <laughs> from your perspective. Um, I have something prepared here, uh, but I will not really bore you with a with long speech uh, because I think uh, we need to focus on, on, on a couple of most important things that I heard. 
One is that when we talk about, when my commissioner talks about farming, he really believes that the farmers are the real friends of the environment. Probably the closest friends of the environment that we have uh, when you look at the whole spectrum of industrial or economic activity, these are probably the closest you can get to those who actually understand nature, are close to nature, live nature, and actually what they do is part of their livelihoods, part of their family life, the real farmers. So farmers are natural allies of the natural habitats. If you let them be farmers, they're natural allies. So I think that's one point that, that he likes to make, and, and I repeat it after him. Another one is that I think our picture of farming, and the commissioner also believes it's the same, our picture of farming is skewed oftentimes by looking at the worst performers. We do have huge diversity of farming practices in the EU and around the world. Some, um, some of those practices are, are egregious, and the commissioner has been very vocal about criticizing some of the forms of farming, some of the uh, practices that create huge imbalances, be it in terms of nutrient balance in the soils, or in types of intensive uh, industrial, almost like farming, etc. So, so we have to also pay attention that we are dealing with an extremely diverse, not only farming systems, but also environments in which farmers operate, etc. Not all farming is bad, um, and I think we miss that. Sometimes we look through the prism of the worst performer and judge the farmers and farming only through that prism. It's a big mistake. And when you look really at the future of the farming uh, of CAP, let's say CAP policy, and my commissioner started a bit of a reflection himself. Uh, you know, he's been talking recently uh, about the recent census data that was released on the situation of farmers in, in Europe. And the and picture's pretty dismal. Uh, well, one is that farmers are disappearing. Somebody mentioned here land being abandoned, etc. Farmers are disappearing, they're aging. There's 25% fewer farms now than, 20, than uh, 10 years ago. We have a situation which is not just, it's not just due to concentration, it's not just due to uh, creating larger farms, but it's also bankruptcies and basically people moving out of farming. And what is even more worrisome is that it is not the industrial, the, the, let's say, worst performers that are disappearing. These are the allies the green allies that are disappearing. These are the ones who are, let's say, operating in small, medium type of farming frameworks in the kind of a circular mixed, mixed uh, plant uh, livestock production model types of farming. They are disappearing. The mixed farms are disappearing. These are the farms where actually we want to, we actually have that circular economy going in those mixed farming environments. These are the ones that are disappearing at the fastest pace. And these are the places where actually uh, you can mitigate properly uh, some of the livestock um, uh, problems, for example. So for my commissioner, uh, while he absolutely believes that sustainability and environmental protection is an absolute necessi necessary condition for, for farming to survive, and we've seen droughts, there's been, uh, you know, uh, notwithstanding the crisis in Ukraine, etc., but th we've seen serious climatic events that lowered the, le the yields last year, in maize, for example. So it is real, and uh, sustainability is a necessary condition for farmers to survive and agriculture to survive in the long run. But it is not a sufficient condition. It's not a sufficient condition. It would be very unfortunate to have, let's say, um, um, environment which is protected in the most optimal way without farmers, or with food produced through, I don't know, high-level industrial processing. Do we want that? I don't think so. If we take into account the full ecology of a human existence, I think we'd like farmers to be present in our habitats, especially those who are friends of nature and those who are closest to nature, those who actually understand the habitats more than other producers, mostly in cities, disconnected from a natural environment. So uh, this is just some impressions. Um, uh, I was asked to uh, discuss a little bit the future uh, and how the CAP strategic plans, for example, will, will move ahead. Um, uh, I don't know how much time I still have. One, two minutes, a couple of minutes. Um, uh, well, you're all very well versed in how our CAP strategic plans. I've heard a lot of opinions on this, how, how member states have, you know, obviously a lot of freedom and some of them can be less or l more ambitious about them. 
Uh, but I think uh, the voices that said that we are more ambitious now than before, um, I, I take them as a positive sign. Uh, you all know how our fertilizer communication looks like. We understand that uh, we will try to move to a more efficient use of fertilizers. We'd like to substitute mineral fertilizer for organic fertilizers. Um, we would like to, uh, uh, you know, see how we can more widely use recovered nutrients by recycling organic waste, etc., from livestock manure. I'm coming back to my point about mixed farms here. Um, there is this integrated nutrient management action plan that will be adopted in 2023. So, uh, you know, we all are in agreement that we must seize opportunities arising from this fertilizer crisis to accelerate our green and digital transitions. The research innovation, and Sylvia covered it very well, I won't touch about it, I won't, I won't touch on it. Um, but on the, on the finally, on the, um, on the cap, you know very well, I'm not gonna focus on, you know, what kind of conditions the cap has and, and, and et cetera, because I think it's re regurgitating what you all know. We have 184 eco schemes. I agree, some of them are better than others. Some of them will probably do more in terms of contributing to climate and environmental goals than others, but will be very, very attentive in our review of cap strategic plans, also with a view to amendments of them uh, that, they, that they actually do the job they're supposed to do. So now we have the cap strategic plan approvals. Each member state had to sub officially submit its cap strategic plan by 1st of January. Um, by 18th of March, all plans have been sent. I think we are pretty much on the finish line with most of them, with all of them. Then there was a, you know, the whole process, I'm not gonna repeat it. Um, but uh, we really want to start on the 1st of January with a, with a new policy. For the future, uh, we'll do the review of cap strategic plans. We'll have to see, and I will not, I'll try not to beat the, the dead, uh, kind of be beat it, uh, uh, not try to re-emphasize again the census, but, but uh, my commissioner was quite moved by what he, what, he, what he saw in that census. So I think a lot of his future ideas will, be, will actually be relating to that uh, and how to uh, uh, merge, again, the concern with having farmers around, but also taking into account uh, proper application of environmental and climate ambitions. So, well, thank you very much for your invitation and uh, I hope you have a good day and uh, wish you a nice evening. Till next time, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. Um, before we go over to the networking drinks, um, I would like to first, of course, thank all of you for being with us here today whether it's in the room physically or virtually. Um, and I would like to also flag that this event, uh, this event has been recorded and the recording as well as the presentations will be shared with you. And we will now hear some very last words from Ariel Bruna, uh, Deputy Director and Head of Policy at BirdLife Europe and Central Asia. And then we'll see you at the bar. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you for your patience also of uh, sticking with us throughout. Thank you for the commission uh, colleagues to be uh, sort of brave enough to uh, listen to our criticism. It is really appreciated. Um, so where are we? Um, so the first thing uh, that, uh, I mean, there was a little bit of it at the beginning, but needs to be said is that we are heading toward a major catastrophe. The scientific consensus out there is that in terms of climate change and biodiversity and ecosystem, we are going down a cliff. And this will cost a lot of human lives, let alone you know, a lot of birds and butterflies and so on. That's where we are going. The science is very, very clear about it. So all the nice speaking about, well, it's better than before, it's better in the U than the US, it will be even better later on, we are driving into the wall. Either we hit the brakes and make a U-turn, or we crash into the wall. And at the moment, we are still driving into the wall. You can have debate about whether we are pushing the accelerator even stronger or maybe a bit, uh, a bit less stronger, but into the wall, that's where we are going. And that's where we are sending our farmers. And the farmers will be the first one to pay the consequences of it. 
that's not a happy message, but it is the reality. The second uh, thing is that, at least in our reading of the plans, it is a lot of business as usual. Yes, some countries are better than others, some regions are better than others, some schemes are better than others, some schemes are better than they were last time. Uh, but overall, in terms of what is the message it's giving to farmers, is it giving farmers the message, you know, move away from heavy reliance on pesticides and fertilizers, move to agroecology, reduce livestock densities, uh, become more resilient to climate change, look after biodiversity, bring back the pollinators. Broadly speaking, no, it's sending them the message, hang on, keep doing what you've been doing all the time and what they've been doing all the time. Of course, some of them have been doing fantastic stuff, but overall, on average, cumulatively, the facts are out there and, and, they, are, and they are very clear. Then there is uh, the, the issue of time. I mean, the attempts to make the CAP less harmful and the hope that it would actually deliver for the environment has been going on for about 40 years now. 40 years. Um, we've been working on it for, you know, what, 20 years over. The promises that were made this evening here have been made already about cost compliance then about the greening, then about. So, you know, uh, excuse us a certain cynicism at this point, but saying kind of, oh, well, yeah, we know it failed, but this time it's newer, it's greener, it's shinier, and then when we look at it, we say it looks just like last time, you say, oh, why are you so negative? Come on, you know, uh, yeah, give us a break. Let's see in a couple of years' time. This is exactly the debate that we've had last time and the time before that. And what the scientists are telling us is the time is running out. And, and the window of opportunity is closing and the problems are already happening. So look at this summer the droughts and the fires and the floods, the moment that the drought has not even ended. It's here, you know, we've spent time warning that it's coming, it's coming. It's not coming anymore, it has already arrived. And uh, you will read the report, I hope. Uh, our impression is that with those plans, we are not sorry. Uh, and we would really like an engagement on the facts. Sorry for the question about, you know, the specific graph, but still, you know, I would like, uh, you know, more engagement on the, f on the facts. Because it's all fine and good to say that there are a lot of good farmers and we should support them and so what. But the question of why are we putting a lot of money into coupled support for livestock and so little money into extensification of management of grasslands, it's a very specific question, you know, and, and how are we spending the money and what message is this giving to the, to the farming sector? And we would like to have the debate on those, on those uh, specific facts. Um, and I would really um, finish uh, in terms of uh, kind of looking into the future. Um, we'll be doing our thinking about the next CAP, just like, uh, like the commission will be doing. By the way, in the short term, I hope that those plans will be improved. I hope the commission will ask for improvements of the plan, and I hope that we won't see the plans becoming even worse, because we are hearing in the council that member states want to already amend the plans as soon as the ink is dry, with the logic is that that's what they've got away with when the commission was looking, and now they are hoping that they can get away with the rest uh, when the commission is not looking. Uh, and by the way, we did warn the commission. We warned the previous commissioner and, we, and the current commissioner when the new um, delivery mechanism came out. You can go back in time and find you know, what we were saying about it back then. We said, you, unless you will ferociously uh, control the plans, you are destroying the common of the common agricultural policy. We think that what we see is 
pretty much what we warned would, would happen. That said, that's the short term. But on the medium term, where do we go next? And we'll need to think very carefully as environmental movement, do we just want to go into yet another reform cycle on the same basis of public money for public goods and uh, better schemes and so on, uh, I risk retiring, assuming that you know, there are still pensions and uh, that I'm still alive and so on, having spent basically my whole working life trying to reform this unreformable thing. Now, that's not a very appealing prospect, frankly. So, I think that the question of is this thing so broken and so unreformable that the only thing you can do with it is throw it away and build something new is now on the table. It's unescapable, given how many promises, broken promises have already been made. That's one thing you need to think about. The second one is what do we do with legislation? Because what we see is that the improvements that we do see come in the places where we have good legislation that is being even partially implemented. All this money spending is not delivering much. Not just for the birds that go like this, but for the farmers who are also going like this. So, maybe it's time to think a lot more about actually binding legislation than about distributing money, knowing that what drives the small, sustainable, farm mixed farmers out of business is other farmers and other businesses that are competing with them. So preventing the bad guys from doing bad stuff is also a way of protecting the good guys doing the good stuff. So this uh, idea that underpins the CAP still that we should allow everybody to do what they want, but then try to subsidize the good guys, and then somehow, incidentally, we always subsidize the bad guys, it doesn't go very, very far. Food for thought, food for discussion. You've been listening to us, and certainly to me, for way too long. You have some drinks, it's quite hot and stuffy, so I'm sure you will appreciate some uh, cold liquids. Have a nice evening.